alternate verses with me. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Verse 27, And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit for of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, but because the harvest is come. Let us pray and uh, look to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this morning that you have given to us, that we can come into your presence and worship you for who you are. And also, Lord, uh, that you have given us moments around your table to examine ourselves, to recognize who we are in the light of your grace and in the light of, Lord, uh, your work on the cross of Calvary. Here we are as we come around your precious word, desiring to be spoken by thee, to be ministered by thee. Lord, we ask that you would remember us this morning and grant to us that life-giving word of yours, whereby we are enabled to live out your word, whereby we have this in of our lives to have your word, Lord, bring forth fruit and harvest that you so long to reap. Father, we thank you, we praise you for the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed to us, Lord, uh, that you are speaking to us as we yield to you. You are more than eager to reveal your truths to us that would transform us. Unworthy as I am, hide me and speak through me to me to each one of us this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Before I bring uh, the word, I just would want to uh, acknowledge that I had to be a, out away from uh, this morning's uh, first part of our worship service uh, for, a, for witnessing a baptism uh, of a dear one whom we pray about throughout our all night prayer times at least and also through uh, even the church prayer, um, we have a family by name uh, Yuli and Swati, and uh, we had the rejoicing time of witnessing the baptism of this special child. And uh, it was a joy to see uh, in all that the Lord has done in this home, and uh, uh, it was my portion to be there and to rejoice with the family and glorify God. So. Uh, with that note, let me um, bring to us the word that the Lord has. We've been looking at the mysteries of the kingdom of God. As Jesus began to teach in parables, uh, he is bringing uh, the truths of the kingdom of God in the parabolic form, unlike how he was teaching in propositional truths throughout his ministry as it was coming nigh to the close of his ministry. A year or a year and a half before he was to go to the cross, the Lord purposefully uh, goes about to teach in this form. And as I have brought to us in verses 11 and 12, that there are two different groups uh, that he is, he is bringing these uh, parables to which actually clarifies to us as to why he is teaching in parabolic form. There are these groups who, to whom this parables or the mysteries of the kingdom is hidden, concealed, and there are these 
the other set of people, or particularly his disciples and those that are open, uh, to whom the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed, not just in parable, but also in its explanation, in its truths, uh, in the meaning that these parables uh, have. So when we come to these parables and the mysteries of the kingdom, you and I are to come, as I have alluded to last week, to have our lives be examined as to what kind of uh, things are seen in our life, in, in our hearts, in our day-to-day -day, um, day -day living about the working of God's word. And so we, we saw uh, the parable of the sower and we also began to look at the parable of the uh, candlestick or uh, the candle being brought and kept under a bushel or a candlestick. So as we uh, took note of this parable of the sower, uh, I have brought to us an important thing that is uh, that these parables are image uh, or word pictures. God is giving to us to illustrate his heavenly truths with a, an earthly story, with a story that is familiar so that we can relate to and understand the heavenly truths. And so there is this word pictures that are thrown aside these heavenly truths so that there is this light that would shed abroad upon the truths themselves. And now when those truths are being brought to us, uh, we are examining our hearts, we need to take a look at uh, each of these parables would have one main propositional truth as opposed to trying to gather as to what each and every item in the story would represent and would have to have some representation, we ought to take the big picture of what the Lord is wanting us to take note of. And so a parable is given to us to give a, a, an image or a, a big picture rather than all the nitty gritty things. And so having looked at all that, last week uh, we saw from the parable of the sower that it has to do with the fruit yieldingness of the word of God. If there's anything important of the parable of the sower, it is primarily about the four kinds of soils and more importantly, the last kind where there is yielding of the fruit to the word of God, which is the seed. So if our lives are to be kept in the midst of that parable, they are to be seen as to the four kinds of hearers that are there. And we saw in detail about the first and the last kind. If you were here last week, you would have taken note that we went a much deeper to understand about the first kind, that is the wayside hearers. Those of these fields are separated by a hard sand where people walk and those are the fences of these big fields. As the sower is see, sowing his seed, these seeds fall on the wayside and they are being picked up by the, by the birds of the air. And just like the explanation that the, that the Lord Jesus had given, there is this word that is being sown and nothing of any change is happening in the lives of these wayside hearers. And uh, we often see that in many of our own loved ones, many that might even go to church on a regular basis, but have no change or transformation that is happening. It is, uh, as in our own culture, we hear this, right? Famously hearing it from one ear and releasing it from another ear, uh, and nothing happens. Uh, and if you ask them, what you have heard, uh, they'll be clueless as to what they have heard. They might have sat down in the sermon for a, an hour, but uh, they have nothing that they actually retain. And so is it with regards to these wayside hearers. Apart from that, I also touched in much detail about the fruitful hearers, or uh, the hearers that actually have fruitfulness, 30, 60, and 100 fold. But I haven't gone too much deep into the other two that I would just touch a little before I come back to this parable of the candlestick that we began to unwrap. 
And so the other two hearers are one, uh, the first kind, or the, actually in these four kinds, we see it as the second kind, that is the shallow hearers. Those I've explained that the farmer unknowingly has upon his farmland a lime rock underneath about a, about a feet below. He wouldn't have any clue and he would still go ahead and sow the seed. A farmer would never sow the seed until he takes out his rocks that are seen on the face of the ground. But unknown to him, there could be a hard rock beneath his farm, unfortunately, and he still goes about to sow the seed. And so is it with regards to these shallow hearers. And you would see this in the, in the Christendom of today as well, where anyone who would hear God's word and are so excited there is this feeling orientedness, there is this emotion, there is this response with tears as well, the tears of joy flowing out, and all because of the, uh, the way they've been carried away by the emotion, maybe of the preacher, or even for that matter, of a story that might have illustrated some kind of a truth. And so they are so, uh, uh, so carried away by the feelings or emotions, so much so that they would even respond and even try to convince others. Sadly, many uh, of the pastors as well might be carried away with their emotional response as though it is the true response. And uh, you would see that they would be starting to come to every church meeting and there is uh, such response of emotional uh, that uh, you would not see even in a genuine Christian as well sometimes. And uh, after a brief uh, high time of emotions, soon enough when it comes to the reality of a response to what would happen uh, uh, to uh, how they look towards sin, how they would look to suffering for Christ, whether they be willing to stand in faith, even in trials, or even in tough times, or even in temptations, you and I would not see them, because they have believed in the word, thinking that Jesus is a, just a healer, Jesus is a fixer of all their problems. And uh, today in, in Christendom you'd see this, large crowds, big churches, and uh, huge emotional responses, great testimonies, and uh, finally, there is no fruit of the Spirit of God and all the five kinds of fruits that I have brought out as a list. Uh, and so, when we see that the intent of God in, in sowing the seed of God's word through various means, through the sowers that are the channels or th to the, through the servants of God who toil to sow the word of God, you and I, the intent of God is that he would bring a fruit, as we have looked at last week, the various kinds of fruit. The first one, the fruit of repentance. There is no genuine repentance of the sinful uh, lifestyle and sin that is so abhorring to God that is prevalent in them, in these emotional hearers or shallow hearers that I would name them as. And so, there's so much about emotion, there's so much about feeling. It's so important about what they feel more than what they actually would want to have a change in their lives. If the feeling is not there, they would not continue in faith. There is only as much as this emotion and feeling that would lead them, so is it that they would keep hearing God's word. And so, so is this shallow hearer where there is no fruit of repentance, there's no fruit of righteousness, as we talked about. There's no fruit of reverence or lips, uh, where, it, where there is this giving of thanksgiving. And there is no fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, as character traits that are formed in a Christian, a true Christian, who would have a genuine conversion. There is no such change of life. It's only about some problems that have been fixed. And so is their faith filled with uh, Jesus as a problem fixer rather than a true Lord and Savior where their lives are brought under the surrendering of God's will 
and a change that Jesus would want to produce. And finally, there's no fruit of labor. They would never would want to uh, labor for Christ. And so their lives would not correlate with this calling of the early Christians. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, we see that the apostles, uh, Paul and Silas, uh, later on, Paul and, first Paul and Barnabas, as they were preaching and teaching in various new churches, they go about to say, they confirm the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith. That is a genuine faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Such is not, such is not there in the dictionary. Tribulation, they would say bye-bye to Christian lives. And so that's, that's the only shallow kind of faith you would see in a number of people whom you would see that they actually seem to have believed in Christ, but their faith is shallow as only for the solutions of their problems as much as the Savior and Lord that Jesus is. And uh, so there's these shallow hearers, just like scorching sun, when that plant, as it brings out its shoot, uh, gets dried out without having no roots to draw the nutrients from the ground, so is their life just shallow, living for a season and fading out soon without a true genuine conversion. And so is Christianity today, because of which Christ's name is being, uh, is, is, is being blasphemed because of a, an unchanged, unrepented, or no, no penitence in their lives, no change in their hearts. So having looked at this shallow uh, hearers, we look at uh, the fourth, the third kind of the four. The third kind of hearers is this worldly hearer. And uh, this might seem much close to the, uh, much close to the other kind, but it is different. Let's turn to read uh, in Mark chapter four. Verse sixteen is where we saw the shallow hearers, and those. And these are they likewise which are sown on a stony ground who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no roots in themselves and so, in, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. How clear is the description of the Lord of these shallow hearers. And may that be so that none of us are so that we are just emotionally responsive. Christianity is not about feeling orientedness. Jesus is not about our happiness as much as he is about our holiness. He is interested in our character rather than our coziness. And so is it that shallow Christianity is not going to take us anywhere. It might seem good for a season, but Christ is after our holiness in making us like him. And if, if God's word is not bringing such genuine change, it is so sad to say that there is this shallow Christianity that would still linger and actually spoil the true work of the fruit yielding Christian lives that Christ and the kingdom of God so desperately is at work in this world. Moving on to the next, that is this worldly hearers, in verse 18 we see, and these are they, talking about the worldly hearers, which are sown among thorns, such as, the, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it, it becometh unfruitful. This is where this word, the seed, has not been cast on a stony ground underneath a, a one foot of a soil, but actually it is, it's a good soil. But you know what? There are these uh, thorns and thistles, or these weeds that come out of this farmland, often for various reasons. Some weeds come by the seeds that these birds actually put in. We all know about those, and some are mysterious. They just sprung up, they just spring up. And if you just try to take out the shoot of that weed and leave the root, it'll again come up. That's, you should take uh, a look at 
how hard it is to pull these weeds. It's so easy to pull out the, 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 uh, the plant which actually is planted out of the seed than the weed, where you put all your energy and you'll, you'll actually end up troubling yourself. And so these are the worldly hearers where they have, unfortunately, the seed, I mean, this is to, to say that their heart has been given room to the seeds of this world as well. As much as they give room to the seed of this word of God, they give room to the seeds of the world. As much as it is important for them about hearing God's word, so is it important about things of this world as well. They have not left the world, but they want the word. You see this in, even in the lives of our Israelites who have, who have actually come out of Egypt, but Egypt has not come out of their hearts. They have gone out of passing the Red Sea in the miracle of how God had delivered them from the enemy's uh, captivity and also from the high tides of the Red Sea, they have passed that. They have come to this uh, journey of the promised land, but their hearts are back in Egypt. Oh, how we long to actually have those, those uh, cucumbers and uh, those, those foods that we had in Egypt. They still want the pleasures of the Egypt in their hearts. How many of them don't we find in Christianity today where the world is not something that they would want to give up, but they still want to hold on to the both. And so you see that even in the scripture as well. We see in the life of Judas Iscariot, if we turn our Bibles, uh, in John chapter 12, verse 6, he's been with Jesus for almost three and a half years. And you know, at the end of it, we see that his heart's true love comes out. We would see what that love is, but here in John chapter 12, verse 6, talking about Judas, when he opens up and says, why don't we actually take this precious ointment and sell it and get the money to give it to the poor? And this he said, that is Jesus saying, I mean, uh, this, talking about Judas, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bare what was put therein. This is after Judas uh, actually uh, was uh, saying against Mary when she broke the spikenard ointment and had anointed the feet of Jesus. We see that Judas Iscariot threat actually says words against uh, Mary. And to that Jesus, uh, in verse 7, he says, Let her alone against the day of my burying had she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me ye have not always. You know, the world is so precious, even more than Jesus for them. But they don't want to give away Jesus, because that is also uh, attractive to them for a season. And so is it with Judas, and also with many. Uh, and the thing that is a problem for them is that there is this allegiance to the two different kinds of love that is cropping up. One is, they'd want to develop a love for Christ, but there is another love which is the root of all evil. We all know this in 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's read this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 10, talking about... Uh, the root of all evil, this is what Paul exhorts Timothy, and he says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, Patience, meekness. This is, the, this is the call for a man of God. You and I cannot have our allegiance to two, to two masters. We see that in the words of our Lord Jesus. No man serves two masters. He has to give up his allegiance to either of them. 
And here is it, that this love of money, not money to save, money is a neutral resource God has given that we could use it wisely, mastering over it, or we could be foolish to let it master us. And living in such a, 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 uh, such a lifestyle that we are, uh, in all the luxuries, in all that comforts that God has given, subtly we can just give in to the love of money where as a fool we can let it master us. We are driven to be under its control as opposed to being able to master it, to use it wisely for the things that matter for eternity. Oh, how in this world there are many who'd want to do uh, not just extra time to earn extra bucks, but also to do more than one job, two or three jobs, to get all that they can. Like a fool, as Jesus gives out in another story, that as he piles up his bonds with lots of things, the Lord says, tonight I require of your soul, what would become of you, O fool? What have you to gain of all that you have stored up and piled up? And so is it with this worldly hearers where there is this love for money, the root of all evil that has not been taken out, that has not been plucked out. That, that, see, that weed is still there causing and choking the word of God not to bring forth the due fruit. No wonder we see even Paul the Apostle was, was fooled by the so-called uh, individual whom we would see that he says good words about and at the end in end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse, verse 10 we read for Demas had forsaken me having loved this present world he writes good words about Demas he didn't he even was actually able to help him in ministry and towards the end of his life, Paul writes this about Demas and says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Oh, what a sad ending. The love of money, the cause for a worldly hearer not to let the word of God bring its due fruit. The choking effect on the word of God. And so we see coming back to Mark chapter 4, Apart from this shallow hearers, the worldly hearers, where the word of God, although it might be springing forth like a plant, although it might be even coming out like buds have come out to bring forth fruit, but the fruit is not complete. It becomes unfruitful. It just falls apart, all because of the choking effect of the love of the worldly cares, as we see. And so, when we look at it, no wonder the call of uh, Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, verse 15, we read, Love not the world, and neither the things that are in this world. And then, as, in, as a conclusion to that command that the Spirit of God put there, he gives an important truth for us to take note of. He says, if, a, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in Him. You cannot entertain these two loves. And either the love of money or the love of the Father. One has to displace the other. And so may that be that we guard our hearts in our pure allegiance to the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts. And not give room for the love of money that can choke the word of God that is so lavishly being poured out into our lives. We can hear a number of sermons. If there is no change that is being produced in us, if there is no fruit, if there is no character, if there is no Christ-likeness, there is this great danger, this grave danger, that our lives is close to entertaining this love of money, which is the root of all evil. And so, coming back to uh, the conclusion, the fourth soil is what we've been looking at as in 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, as it bears fruit, it ought to bring forth these five fruits. 
Don't think that fruit is so much about just or oh, the effect of coming to church, the effect of trying to talk Christian-like, the effect of trying to help somebody, give some money to the poor, all this the world can mimic it. But not the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of a true genuine thanksgiving, a reverence where we would want to have God be glorified through our lives. And finally, the fruit of a true labor, as we saw in Philippians 1, 21. So, coming back, we would need that the Lord would allow us to see and rejoice in that fruit. Don't be settled down that I am able to come to church every Sunday and hear God's word. And not fool ourselves that I am a better Christian than somebody who is not coming to church. Yes, that individual has to come to church and be in this not forsaking the assembling of saints as the scripture does say, but coming itself is not the end of the story, it is just a means. And so moving forward, apart from the, this marvelous word producing in us this fruit, we began to unwrap the parable of the candle uh, in a, on a candlestick. In verses 21, we saw the manifesting word and uh, this parable rightly comes after the parable of the sower i would say as god's word is given the due place it would continue to reveal and manifest all things as plain and clear to our lives and that is true of this uh, second parable that is the parable of the candle upon a candlestick it ought to be given the due place, but let's continue to see what else this parable has to say. In verse 22, it says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifest, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. And then he goes about to say, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. So here, this might seem very obvious. Only somebody who has a hearing uh, would actually get to hear. If you and I are deaf, you and I would never hear. But there is this spiritual hearing that we all know that Jesus is talking about. And taking to, uh, talking, uh, continuing on that next verse, he says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Now, in verse 23, the first thing that we need to take note is that what does it mean by Jesus saying that if any man have ear, let him hear. It is to make us check ourselves to, to where our heart is or the intent of our heart, the intent is vital for the content to be given to us. If you and I have not the right intent to receive the truth of God's word, you and I would never receive what God is saying. And so was it with these two groups that were there. One, the disciples to whom these parables were given, and the other group of maybe Pharisees and the large crowds who are just coming for various other reasons, whether it be to catch something in what Jesus says, or whether it be to just entertain themselves in all the stories that Jesus is saying. It won't result in any fruit at the end of the day, but they just would be there to hear what Jesus has to say. And that's not going to result in letting them truly hear. And so Jesus is opening up to say, our intent in wanting to humbly come to hear the voice of God is prior and prerequisite to the content of letting the voice of God change us inside out. And so when he says, if any man have ears, if any man has this, that true intent, that prior intent, they will receive the content. They're not going to miss the content. And that willing, humble desire to hear the voice of God. And that brings out a question. How many of us actually come praying, God speak to me this day? As we come to the Lord's day, as we come to hear God's voice, are you and I willing to humble ourselves and say, God, make 
your voice be clear. Speak to me. Or we could come by saying, oh, let me see what so-and-so has to say. Or does he have anything new to say to me? Or if you are only seeing the man who is standing here rather than the word of God, the spirit of God who is wanting to take the preached word of God and apply to, to our hearts who is amidst us, are you willing to humble yourself to let God's word do that work? And if so, you and I would be blessed to not just receive, but receive it in abundance. And that's what we see in continuation. And he said, take heed what you hear. That is, what is your motive to hearing God's word? Is there a motive to hear God's voice and humble yourself and myself that God's word would bring that change? Or if you have any other motive, this is what would be. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that here shall more be given. This might seem unfair. In fact, in the verse below, we read in verse 25, For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken even what he, which he hath. Doesn't it sound unfair? Jesus is not social. He's not wanting to distribute evenly. Oh, the poor people are lacking basic necessities and they should have the rich people give something to the poor so that the poor can have some basic necessities. That's our social thinking, right? And even so, our thinking about God's word is also in the, in the man-oriented thinking where we would want to think that it should be fair for God. Everybody should be getting more and more God's word. Not so in heavenly thinking. That's why we were reminding in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not like your ways. As high as the heavens are, so are my ways and my thoughts above your thoughts and your ways. That's why the parables are to bring that earthly truth, the heavenly truth to the earthly, with earthly stories for us to comprehend God's ways. And so when we see for the disciples who are receiving these parables and also the explanation, it is, it is required of them that they, they give. No wonder they preserved it in the scripture for us. They took to remember that, they took to pass on that to the next generation. You and I are receiving God's word and truth. Are you and I faithful to give to others? And that's what we read here. With what measure you give to others, so is it that we receive. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a calling of us becoming the channels of receiving and giving. And more of it as we are giving, more of it that we are faithful to the text of giving the true uh, message of God's word to others, God is giving to us more and more. You find it interesting that there are those preachers today where they would begin to say what they have to, their opinions more about God's word, and they'll just be saying stories and not be faithful to the text of the scripture. They would have worldly thoughts to actually add to the word and message rather than godly thoughts to correct the worldly thinking. And uh, no wonder the church and the people and themselves are starving for the truths of God's word in today's Christendom. But there are those who are faithful in giving out the truths, in being faithful to the text. And there, there is this plenty of God's word that is given to us, given to them and to the churches and to the preachers. As they expound God's word and are faithful, there is more and more of inflow of the truths of God's word. And uh, here, what is uh, not fair that we think is that those that are having a little of God's word, from them also this word is being taken out and being given to those that, ha that have more, right? That seems unfair for us. But the truth is, those that have that little have no intent in them to wanting God speak to them. And what is the use of that remaining word as well? And so Jesus says, or God says that he is interested to give to 
those that have that right intent to receive more rather than those that have not that intent. And so is it in verses 25 we read, For he that hath to him shall be given. He that hath is having that intent to receive and so there will be multiplying of that word into their lives. And he that hath not, there is no intent to each even have what they have because there is no intent in them. And so there is no use of he ha giving them that content of the truth of God's word. So from them it is taken and given back. And so this abounding and multiplying word that we see is with those that have the true motives. And so this manifesting word would continue to be abounding and multiplying in their lives. And so if you and I are continuing to hear the voice of God, if you and I are continuing to receive the abounding truth of God's word, may it not be so that we be puffed up or we be over rejoicing rather than humbling ourselves and being grateful to God that God has pleased to reveal these precious truths to us which are hidden from many who in this world have not that privilege. And so when we come to see that uh, this candle uh, upon a candlestick parable, it is revealing to us about the manifesting word and about the multiplying word, you and I are to rejoice at the truth of God's word coming our way. And uh, I'll just begin, maybe because of the lack of time, I'll close here, but uh, I'll just begin to open up uh, on, uh, um, on this parable that is in verse 25, verse 26. So he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast the seed in the ground. This is the parable of sowing seed and and harvest. Um, and uh, this parable's main truth that uh, we, we can take is the mystery of the growth. We see that in verse 27. And should, this is talking about the sower, he's, he has seen, he has sown the seed in the ground and then he sleeps and rises night and day and the sheep and the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth it not how. The sower has no clue as to how it produces the fruit. There is this mystery involved in the working of the kingdom of God. There is this mystery involved in how it is all God who does that growth thing, rather than it is man's work. If there is anything of man's work, it would remain as man's work. I remember of a convert uh, in the times of Charles Spurgeon, after he has preached, uh, one day as it was pouring in rain, he was trying to cross a, a crossing and uh, uh, there was this drunk man on the other side of that crossing. As he sees, he quickly recognizes that this is Charles Spurgeon and he says, Oh, Spurgeon, I am one of your converts, he says. I was converted when you preached. And uh, that guy was uh, wobbling and trying to have his standing. And uh, Charles Spurgeon looked at him and said, Surely you are my convert. Because if you were convert of Jesus Christ, you would not be how you are living. And so is it with our lives that uh, there are many in Christendom today, following the preacher rather than the, the savior. There is this charisma of the preacher that, that is carrying lots of multitudes with them rather than the, the truths of the savior that should carry them, that should lead them into freedom and life and liberty that Jesus Christ promises. And uh, it happens because of the mystery of the growth, mystery of the working of working in God's kingdom. It doesn't happen in what uh, we can see in flesh and blood terms. It's not a human effort. No wonder Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, with this we'll close, in 1 Corinthians 
chapter 3, Puzzle Paul talking about these, these churches and the people in these churches who were following the preacher, who were following Paul, Silas and Peter and they say, one says I am of Apollos, one says I am of Kephas. In chapter 1 verse 12 we see, now this I say that every one of you saith I am Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Kephas, I am of Christ. They are, they are uh, fans of these so-called big preachers as opposed to followers of Christ. And then Paul was trying to address that problem. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says in verse 8, actually verse 6 onwards, I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. In verse 5 as well, he says, actually in verse 4, for while one saith I am of Paul and another I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? In verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Do you recognize the mystery of the working of God? Or are, are you carried away by the charisma of the preachers? May it be so that you and I see the working of, the, you and I come to recognize the mysteries of the kingdom as the mystery of God's work as opposed to human work as many, not just in Corinthian church, also in these last days, the churches are being carried away. It is Christ's work. It is Christ's bride. It is his sacrifice. It is that one sacrifice. As we read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10, we read, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. It is one sacrifice, not a, a human sacrifice. It is Christ's work on the cross. Not just on the cross, but even till date, his washing with the renewing of his word. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, with this verse we'll close. And that is, Paul says to Ephesians church, he says that he's working to present us faultless and blameless before his presence. In verses 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. It is God's work. It is God at work with the word of God, washing us, cleansing us, sanctifying us, whether it be in regeneration or whether it be in sanctification. May we recognize the mystery of growth because of the God who is at work rather than any human effort. And I, let's uh, close our eyes and ask the Lord for his blessing upon the word that uh, he would enable us that we would be those fruit yielding hearers, a fruitful hearers, and that we would be those that would be faithful hearers of God's word, passing on the light of God's word to others, letting his faithful word abound in our lives. Let's uh, pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this morning and this privilege you have given us to let our, your, your word and, he, and the light of your word shine bright in our hearts. Even as we have uh, examined our hearts and even as we see your marvelous and manifesting work and your multiplying word to give us that mystery of growth, Father, we submit ourselves that you would make us to be people that are fruitful hearers of your word and that are faithful channels of passing on your word to others. Whereby, Lord, that uh, we see your faithful working in our hearts, in our lives, in the abounding word. Father, we thank you, we praise you. 
We ask for your blessing upon the rest of our day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace